Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Vermont Room of the Hotel Coolidge. As some of you may know, I'm David Briggs, and I have been right along. <laughs> and um, some of the ground rules, it's OK to get up and walk around. The bar is selling beer and wine. The coffee and tea is free. And you might know that I'm careful about charging things. If you read Facebook, you can see that I charged the lady who was to become my wife $25 to park here. So you didn't answer the question. Yeah, did you repay her? In spades. <laughs> Let's put it this way, it's all worked out. It was love at first sight, and it took eight years to get married. My mother kept saying, don't you think you ought to get married? Anyway, um, thank you to the Historical Society for working with me on doing this. The idea is to get out as much information as I can and make it uh, true that I'm transparent and available and accessible, and I hope you'll keep coming back to me with all your questions. Um, you've heard of Will Rogers, right? Yeah. And. Uh, he said so many funny things. I got this list yesterday, and I picked a couple things out that are pertinent to the spirit of my holding you captive here. But he started off by saying, never slap a man who's chewing tobacco. <laughs> uh, but the ones that pertain are, never miss a good chance to shut up. So I promise you that. And if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. I can promise you that. And then the overarching sentiment is, letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back in. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. My intention is to share with you the story of this building, my story in it, um, which isn't over, and uh, how I got to the various uh, stages that we're at. I've got about 85 slides here. We're going to go fast. It's not the lightning round, but it's going to be clipped. Uh, uh, Jam is recording it today, so you can go back over it if you want to do that, and I'll have copies for you. And just about any of the attachments here, if you ever want them, track me down, okay? So um, with that, let's start it right in. Um, the first slide is Miss Lucille Scully. Miss Scully was my first grade teacher in the fall of 1952. Her classroom was in what's now the municipal building. And if you don't think that little kids hear things from teachers, and if you don't think that teachers put out the right information, listen to this. She left me with two impressions, and I'm not kidding. This has tumbled down the years. Um, one was to be a historic preservationist because of her comments, and the other was to wonder why we had to go through women's lib, because she was so independent and capable. By the time women's lib came around, I thought, do we really need this? Uh, because she would push her piano from one side of the room to the other. But she lamented the fact that there was change in the community on her watch in her years. And by the way, I said this was 1952. Um, in 1928, her first grade class included my dad, Fred Briggs. So we both had the same first grade teacher. It was only 24 years. You know, teachers do a lot more than 24 years. So that's possible, and it happened. Um, so she lamented the passing of the Lyman Homestead. The Lyman Homestead, as you can see, is a classic uh, federal building, full colonial. And it sat right on the corner of the intersection of um, Maple Street and Bridge Street. Here's what it looks to, like today. OK, so you can see what she was talking about. They tore that beautiful building down in 1930 and became uh, a golf station and then eventually a marble bank. People uh, built this building. The other uh, building that she called out was the Smith Chocolate Factory. Now this building, if you look carefully, you see how it slopes down. That's the road going to the underpass. So right on that corner. And it's a beauty. And this really, as you'll see, marks uh, one of the early chapters in the White River story. Here's what that site looks like today. And this is when it looked actually kind of good because Fonda's dress shop was the most chic dress shop for miles around. So it had some real credibility. 
there's details on why this happened that way, and we're not going to get into those today. And then the segue to my involvement here at the Coolidge um, goes back a long, long way, as I'm revealing to you, but I didn't take over until 1985. The seven years prior to that, uh, my wife Sally and I restored a 14-room Queen Anne Victorian in St. Paul, Minnesota. We were part of a huge movement uh, that was a model program for the uh, National Trust. And so that's where we got our teeth uh, into historic preservation. And it was off that, uh, in the summer of 1984, I came home from my 20th reunion at good old Hartford High School and found that this place was up for sale again. And uh, I had just gone through a change in my work, and it was time to exercise that hidden desire to be in hospitality. My mother, whom many of you knew, was ambivalent about that. I was supposed to be an engineer with a good job, benefits, and security. And no, but I had to come and do this. Uh, but that's the background to talk about my devotion to historic preservation, particularly in the sense that I'm about to tear down a historic building. Um, so the thesis of the White River story is based on a lecture that I've been giving since 1992 called The Cycles of Community. And it's meant to be a reassurance that although we go through change that in the moment seems radical and desperate and maybe very disappointing, there is a sense to how this happens. And it was a theory and I developed it for cultural heritage groups that I brought in here over the last 40 years to basically populate the Coolidge and keep it busy with good quality guests. And I can't tell you um, exactly, but somewhere on the order of 10,000 people have listened to this lecture. And it always makes me smile that they all listen to it. They're from all over the country. They're well-educated, well-heeled, and, and uh, well-traveled. And they've heard the whole White River story, and you haven't heard it. <laughs> and they would say to me, do the people around here know what you're doing? And I'd say, no. <laughs> so I'm really glad to have you here today to hear this. Here's the theory, that the cycles of community maybe in a general way start with the concept of establishing ownership, because White River Junction was a blank slate a period of local ownership, inevitably a transition, a period of absentee ownership where that, those initial stakeholders have gone and new investment comes in. And then eventually, in the case of White River, you know that we've been reestablishing local ownership. And now we've even completed the chapter of my theory of local ownership. When I started this in 1992, it was a guess, but it's pretty close. And so the period that we're now in is the transition to a creative economy off what obviously was an industrial or railroad economy. So let's just take a couple shots of what establishing ownership means in these first 30 years. And 30 years, by the way, is about the length of a generation. So there's some validity to this theory. Samuel Nutt brought this building from Enfield. It was a stagecoach shop, stop rendered obsolete by the railroads and plunked it down in exactly the location you're sitting in right now. So this is a long story of three buildings on one site. And not far behind him in 1872 comes George Smith and his chocolate factory. You can see the underpass, you can see the fire station in the distance there. Uh, that lasted until 1933, during the Depression. By the way, I had breakfast yesterday morning with a good fellow named Tom Smith. And Tom is the great-great-grandson of George Smith. He's a professor of chemistry at Williams College. And we were there for a concert, and Tom and I stay in touch. So it was fun to talk about it. The period of local ownership advances to the second phase of the Hotel Coolidge block. The Junction House, uh, as Samuel Nutt built it, had burned down in 1877. And the new owners, or relatively new owners in that period, named the Barons, um, constructed this beautiful Victorian hotel in 1878. And so in the period of uh, local ownership, we have the White River Paper Company. You recognize this building. Uh, the Gates Block in 1890 with the Gates Opera House, now the Briggs Opera House. 
um, the Gates Library, the Twin State Fair, which became the Vermont State Fair in 1907, a reminder of how potent our location was with the rails. The Cadillacs came in on railroad cars. And all the stories that go with this, I could spend all afternoon and more with you, but we're going to move on. The transition of ownership period uh, recognizes things like the Vermont Baking Company, started by George West, had morphed into the Ward Baking Company, and they brought their branded product called Tip Top Bread. Um, the State Fair um, week was a festive time here, and I want to stop and tell a personal story here. On the corner of this building today where Junction Frame is, was the Wilson Brothers Pharmacy. Here's a picture of the Wilson Brothers. See the guy standing in the back? His grandson came through my front door two years ago. Huh? He had this picture with him, and I, and I pulled this one out. I said, you mean this picture? Uh, I got it through eBay. It came all the way from Oregon. Um, but the Wilson brothers, uh, think of it. Look how prosperous they look. Five families reaching some measure of prosperity out of that little drugstore that you couldn't hardly make work for one family today. And in that store, as a youngster, was a fellow named Clayt Rice. You remember Clayt Rice, some of you? Anybody who does, raise your hand. OK. Um, Clayt Rice Sr.'s first job was working for the Wilsons. And I said, what did you learn? He said, oh, he says, one day the door opened up, and the sky came through. And he said, hey, kid, do you sell water here? And uh, I said, yes, we do. And he says, well, you better stock up because we're coming back and that's what we drink. And he told the owner, one of the Wilsons, that a group was coming back and they were an anxious to buy his water. And the owner raised the price from two cents to three cents. <laughs> but Clayt did pretty well and he became the president of the bank and I thought he was trained well. Well, who were those people? Well, they were the advanced movie team for the show Way Down East. And I see we have a VIP here today. <laughs> Shall we tell that story? See if I can get it right. The, the damsel in distress on that block of ice is Lillian Gish. And it's not a stunt double, it's really her. And we know that because on one occasion, I overheard her on the Johnny Carson show one night. She was asked, what's the most exciting thing you ever did? And she said to Carson, oh, it had to be that time I was in White River Junction floating down the river on a cake of ice. <laughs> she had a stunt double. It was a 16-year-old girl in the community. Can you tell the rest of the story, Linda? It was my grandmother. Your grandmother. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> a few years after I took over here, a British documentary team came around and interviewed her. And the clip that came through me, it's a second hand, so you can correct me in public here if you need to, was that her attitude was, no, I never saw that movie, and I don't care if I ever do. <laughs> a good Vermonter, right? Um, people come and go in White River Junction because it's the center of the universe. In 1928, um, Calvin Coolidge comes to town not to stay, but just to see how Vermont's doing after the flood. And here he's greeted by the colorful uh, predecessor to me, Than Wheeler. He looks a little bit like W.C. Fields, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a cute story about him where this woman who's indignant says, one of your waiters spilled cream on my dress. And Than Wheeler's response was, well, that's a lie to begin with. There's no cream in the house. <laughs> I've been waiting to use that line before I quit. Um, the, the Vermont State Fair ran into difficulties with the weather and then the 27 flood, and so it gave way uh, to a dirt runway airport. Dusty Miller, the colorful Dusty Miller of Millerado, uh, was a champion of this airport. And this is a notable picture because the woman on the right in this picture is Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one building left of the airport uh, footprint, and it's behind the China Moon Buffet. Next time you go and take a look, it's one of the original hangars. Uh, the absentee ownership period has largely to do with businesses like the Smith Chocolate Group 
in uh, George West and Vermont Baking growing to where they're more likely to be controlled by outside forces, investments. So the people that live in White River are probably having a sense of lack of control of their destiny. And that cre creates a definite attitude within the community. Um, here's a great picture on Railroad Row. And of course, um, the second wave of immigrants was the, the wonderful Italian community that, that happened here, and the people that did the hard work. Um, now, civic mindedness run, par, runs parallel to this, and I mentioned the, the Gates Library. That was dominated by the Loyal Club. And the Loyal Club pitched in to make sure that when you got off a train, you could see a nice setting. So the Loyal Club Park was what was right out in front of here. And it was replaced in 1934 by the ultimate absentee owner, the US government. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of an insight as to some of these things. I could flesh each one of these chapters out, but we're going to cruise along here. Reestablishing local ownership. Uh, for me is a personal thing because by 1962 I was a sophomore in high school and I'm taking note of just about everything um, and it runs over the 30 year period of my young adult years. Um, this is just after World War II, you can tell by the age of the cars. Um, the Esso station was run by my dad and his partner Elwyn Phillips and that's my dad checking the oil on that car there in that picture. Um, Vermont Cup Flower is the panel truck you see in front of the Newberry store. Um, and Friday night shopping here was definitely a thing, but destined to fade with the rise of big box stores. So the whole White River story's been a little bit of one, you know, two steps ahead, one step back, all the way down the line. Um, by the time that I took over at the Coolidge, um, there was a, a proposition that the courthouse, which was now occupying the post office, was going to move to Sykes Avenue, where a local landowner, a very accomplished self-made guy named Frank Gilman, had offered free land for the courthouse if they would put it there. And there were numerous people that were in favor of that. And the phone rang in my office one morning, and it was a secretary of a very dignified fellow in Woodstock. And she said, Mr. Sincerbo would like to talk to you. Well, that tone didn't set me off because I'd been called to the principal's office so many times <laughs> as a kid. I knew just how to respond to that. I said, okay, put him on. So Bob Sincerbo, a very dignified guy, came on the line. He says, you've got to keep that courthouse in White River. And that's where my alliance with the Preservation Trust of Vermont um, began. And I said, what can I do? They said, stand by. And so I was... I was uh, notified by all the late legislative activities to race off to Montpelier and advocate for it to be in downtown. And I had a formidable ally because the courthouse had been sold to a fellow who eventually built the Powerhouse Mall. His name was Bain Stevenson. So with his ability and his pedigree and his connections, uh, we were able to get the land on Railroad Row purchased from Guilford Transportation because Bain had gone to, to college at Yale with Timothy Mellon, whose family owned the Guilford Transportation. And we paid $125,000 for the land. And the local sentiment was, well, Frank will give us that land. Why, can't, why should we waste all that money? And that was a problem, because $125,000 meant a lot. Hold on to that thought that one hundred and twenty-five dollars is a lot. Um, so what did we do? Well, if you go to Brattleboro, you'll see that the Brattleboro Courthouse is not for not the same courthouse as White River. We took the architectural plans from Brattleboro and used them in White River and saved $125,000. <laughs> um, in 1985, uh, within six weeks of me taking over, goodness knows how I ever did this, why and how it got done. but. I had connections from my St. Paul days because right across the street from that house I showed you lived an up-and-coming rock on tour by the name of Garrison Keeler. And so I was an early on uh, participant or audience member with the Prairie Home Companion. And next door to him came his piano player, this fellow at the piano here named Butch Thompson. 
he was the last guy that I saw when I left St. Paul with uh, two cars, a truck, three kids, a wife, and a dog. And we had spent seven years fixing that house up, and we celebrated it on a Wednesday, and by Sunday morning, we were on our way to take over the Coolidge. And I saw Butch in the yard that day, and I said, uh, he said, where are you going? I said, oh, I just bought this old hotel in Vermont. Will you come and play some music? And he said, sure. Actually, he said, yeah, sure, you betcha. That's Minnesota time. <laughs> well, it gave rise to the notion of what could happen in the Briggs Opera House. And River City Arts got born out of that on the strength of the White River Theater Festival. There's a wonderful story about that. The short version is um, during the Green Mountain Guild years, they had had a young upstart actress in their troupe by the name of Meryl Streep. And they put that in their literature. And so um, people would read that. Now, it wasn't Wikipedia in those days. It was just random pieces of paper. And these two guys came into town one morning in the fall of 1987. And they uh, went to the polka dot diner. And they said to Mary, who was flipping pancakes, where's the theater? She said, I don't know anything about a theater. <laughs> well, if she turned around and looked up, <laughs> She said, why don't you go and talk to Dave Briggs? He knows everything. And that was not a compliment. <laughs> so they came down. They said, we want to see where Meryl Streep performed. Well, I knew the lore. So I said to them, well, let me tell you. We went up to the opera house. It was just dark, big old empty room. And I told them that she had been with the Green Mountain Guild, but uh, they were riding on the fumes of that. And uh, I said, what are you going to do? And they'd just gotten out of St. Louis uh, University, in, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And they said, well, we've been uh, growing up a few years after college. We want to start our own theater company. I said, well, why don't you do it here? So that was in uh, the summer. In November, they said, we'd like to take you up on that deal. It was pretty loosey-goosey. We didn't know what to charge for rent or if we could even get any rent. Um, but they came back. And a memorable day in late spring, I think it must have been the last week in March, um, my dad called me up and he said, hey, there's some noise up in the opera house. I said, oh, that must be those guys, they came back. He said, okay. And that was it. They were up there painting the ceiling. We had no lease, nothing. And uh, they gave rise to their first season that summer of 1988. And their opening show was Children of a Lesser God. The actress was the under, had been the understudy of Marley Matlin, who won an Academy Award for it. Uh, she was a 17-year-old girl from Chicago. In small world, White River is the center of the universe. That girl's parents did the taxes for Byron and Scooter Hathorne. Who would know, right? <laughs> Just watch where you step. So along comes the uh, devotion by the uh, White River Theater Festival, the rename, the space, the Briggs Opera House, salute to my folks. And, um, and so now we go into the transition period of 1992 to 2022, the transition from an industrial economy to a creative economy. Uh, those words were brought to us by a keynote speaker who was the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina. And he was brought to town um, uh, by a special woman in Woodstock. And now I'm blanking on her name. It'll come in a minute. She put together this wonderful thing from her seat with the Vermont Council on the Arts to be um, a tutorial on how you do what they did in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And he brought the words creative economy. So half of the seminar that day was in Woodstock around the Town Hall Theater, and the other half was here, um, here in White River Junction. And that's where we got that definition from. The leading uh, player beyond the Opera House was the Tip Top Building with Matt Busey's wonderful adaptive reuse of that. Along comes the unforgettable David Ford, the Main Street Museum. Um, the Center for Cartoon Studies comes along in due time. And I don't know if you all know this, but do you know that they give a master's degree? It's, so the kids there are not kids. They're college graduates. Um, I've said to the Rhodes Scholar classes that I've appeared for over the years, I said, you know, it's really funny. They look like cartoons. <laughs> and then I said, we all do. 
What we learn have learned from them because this place, the hostel section here in the hotel, the old railroad crew rooms that have bathroom down the hall is the freshman dormitory for CCS. Six or seven out of the um, 10 or 12. Um, along comes the development of Railroad Row. Um, the story of this building, which is meant to emulate or reflect back to the Twin State Fruit Building in sort of a vague way, uh, was the placement of Resource Systems Group, a nationally placed uh, transportation planning group that grew out of the Thayer School. Um, they linked onto Railroad Row because of what we were doing with the Railroad Museum. One thing led to another. And we, uh, we courted them to come here to be a presence uh, in the railroad community. And then there's two other buildings that Bill Bittinger did on the street along the way. Um, Matt Busey again took the American Legion and transformed it into 22 really cool uh, loft apartments. Anybody, anybody here not been in to see those? If you haven't been? So many people. Well, <clears throat> the ceilings are 12 feet high and you sleep on top of the bathroom. They're lofts, you have to climb up. So you gotta be able-bodied to beat it. <laughs> Along comes the plans and the commitment of Northern Stage to expand. And this was the day where the uh, service department came down, giving rise to the Barrett Center and the Northern Stage. And in the process there, um, this real estate transaction was um, a maneuver by Byron Hathorne and myself we were able to come up with a reasonable deal from Bill Miller to buy it. And um, uh, Byron was the person who had the economic clout. I was sort of the uh, liaison. But the secret weapon in this was the fact that Bill Miller would come here for breakfast in his twilight years and open his mail in the cafe. And he would sit down to open his mail and along in a few minutes to sit down right next to him and keep him company was Peggy. So she's the secret weapon. When I said to Bill, would you like to sell Miller Auto Building? He said, sure. And we were off to the races. We didn't quite know what to do with it. Northern Stage was really irritated at us because they thought Bill was going to give it to them. And they didn't know Bill. But Bill, to his word, made a very reasonable deal so that we dealt it back to Northern Stage at cost and kept the land that became the village at White River Junction. Remember I told you about how $125,000 is a lot of money? Well, this building sits on a piece of land that the last year we owned it, we paid the town of Hartford $2,500 in taxes. Does anybody want to guess what that building paid in taxes last year to the town of Hartford? $550,000. So that's why development makes sense to taxpayers. Um, Newbury Market came along at the same time that Tucker Box confirmed that they needed to expand. You may recall that Newbury Market went into a flat period for years where it was a bingo hall. And so finally we had uh, the economic uh, traction to build uh, their expansion and I named it Newbury Market to keep that name public. Um, Mike Davidson uh, in Ledgeworks uh, tackled some of the most unlikely properties in downtown, first of all, which was the uh, Twin State Electric Building, eventually the, the, uh, the Freight House. And as you know, in the last couple of years, he's built this five-story, 69-unit apartment building. So the cycles of community, again, are establishing ownership to go through transitions and absentee ownership and on to our next transition period. And will the next chapter be absentee ownership again? I don't know. Um, so now let's talk about the history on this site, the three buildings on this site. The first building is what I call Colonel Nutt's project. And I mentioned before, he took this building down in Enfield, rendered obsolete by the new railroad, panelized it, and shipped it into rail, by rail into White River Junction. It's sitting right where we are today. It's the only thing in White River except for one other farmhouse, which is on the site of what is now the Gates um, block. And if you look up behind it, you see that gravel pit there? 
And all of us know that that was really an active gravel pit well into uh, the early mid 60s. Um, that's where the aggregate came from uh, to build the railroad embankment. They clawed it down by hand. And if you look up behind Stearns, you'll see the same, same pattern there. They clawed it down by hand there. Um, Samuel Nutt sold his junction house early on to a couple of chicken farmers from Queechy named Barron. And the Barons were very enterprising and good at what they did. But in, 19, in 1877, this building burned down and they replaced it with that Victorian structure that we're going to talk a little bit more about. This is a cool view from up on the gravel bank. Look in the backyard and you can see how they heated this building. It's about 100 cords of wood there, right? And you see the bridges over the rivers are covered bridges. The barons were notable people and the railroad company uh, glommed onto them because they had an idea just after the Civil War to start a tourist section of their railroad by building those fabulous big wood frame hotels in the White Mountains. The Barron brothers built the first generation of all those White Mountain hotels. Today, the last one is the one at Bretton Woods. They didn't build that one, but that's emblematic of the era in which they operated. Uh, they had a national reputation. I haven't done the scholarship, but Scott Fletcher is here, and I'm always aiming for him and I to do the next project. Maybe we'll find out what happened to the Barron Brothers. Um, so here's another view of the Junction House and how splendid it was. And it was destined to be renamed the Hotel Coolidge in 1923 in honor of Calvin Coolidge's father, John, who was a frequent traveler here. Nathaniel Wheeler made good on that relationship by renaming it uh, upon the occasion of Coolidge becoming the 30th president. Uh, alas, it only lasted until January of 1925 when it burned flat to the ground. Now, let me show you another picture of it. In the early going, having clawed that soil down or uh, gravel down to build the railroad embankments, they didn't have the tools to really finish the job. So they built a causeway and you can see that typically people were getting off the trains and throw their garbage into these holes. And that's what gave the inspiration for the Loyal Club Park. Just a, ne a neat side story of how people get excited and care for their, for their town. Um, the Junction House. So the building that we're now in <clears throat> was built in a hurry in 1927, opened in 27. It boasted 160 rooms. Today I can only find 56 <laughs> plus 12 hostel rooms and that's because bathrooms. In 1927 you only needed a bath once a week and so you didn't have the, the facilities that you have today. Um, my th thinking at the time, when I took over in 1985, was to take this basic shape you see here, which looks quite a bit like that shape, when you look at it carefully, and complete it. But by 1987, when I was talking to the state preservationist officer, Eric Gilbertson, he said, you can't do that because this is the historic element. You can't copycat something that's over 50 years old and get away with it. And so one of the challenges we face today was if you can't copy it, how can you tear it down? And so we're going to get into that a little bit in a minute. Here's another view of it from down the street. So I want to bring to you what you came to hear was the case for redevelopment. My concern about this has a personal side as well as a business side. And uh, it, the personal side is my own preference. The personal side is my own uh, devotion to things White River and Hartford. That really does ring true for me. And so my concern was uh, n working the project, the hotel as we have as innkeepers, Peggy and I for the last 30 years, uh, we realized that it has become kind of a mom and pop operation. It's really critically dependent on us showing up for work every day and caring deeply about it and making all the little corrections. Uh, we can't go to retirement 
and bring in a professional management team because the numbers here won't support it. And therefore, uh, the remedy would be to sell it to somebody like us who's younger. And the, the fear and the theory of that is knowing what we know about the condition of the building is that those people are going to run into difficulties. Um, I got to tell you, in the uh, 40 years since I've been doing this, I get up every day with springs in my feet. I don't get up and say, oh, I got to do that again. So it's a natural fit, but who else is going to do that? That's my thinking, right? And you see organizations go through all these gyrations where they struggle and they ultimately fail and there's shenanigans and now the community's impacted by it. And I said, furthermore, we're already diminished to where we're not a 160 room hotel anymore. We're basically a 50 room hotel. 20, in round, round numbers, 20 monthly rentals that are aimed at Dartmouth grad students and Hitchcock uh, traveling nurses, and 30 guest rooms that really function as a nice in-town country inn. Very proud of the fact that they do that. I gotta tell you one observation. When I was in high school, that lobby out there had a tile floor, and the ambiance of that room was about like a bus station. It was really pretty gritty. It wasn't fancy. And if you went into the men's room, it was a pay toilet. That's how kind of un, uh, gentrified it was. And uh, I just get such a kick out of coming down those stairs on any given night to see a young family sitting in front of the fireplace with their stocking feet on and little kids playing on the floor, right? That just never would have happened. So the in-town country inn has been a charming aspect of it. But the overarching role of this piece of property in the middle of uh, White River Junction is to, has been to be dominant, to be dignified, and to be a real contributor. Well, I started looking at the structural condition of the building, and it has some severe limitations. You could bring a lot of investment into it and still not be enough. In addition to it, the shape of the building is very narrow. It was built in a time, I'm going to show you this property survey. Train your eyes here. The Hotel Coolidge footprint is a U-shaped building on the left. And you can see there's quite a bit of space in the backyard that's not used. The building's very narrow. And that's because the way they ventilated buildings before mechanical systems was basically to open the windows and let the wind blow through. And that was true even in the inner city. If you go into older brick buildings, you'll find they're like a donut. And if you get on the inside, you can see into the middle of that donut. So it was typical. How do you get the most use out of this site is the question. So coverage of the available land. Uh, the need for housing you've heard about uh, more and more over the last several years. Um, it's compelling. Uh, one set of figures says that we need a certain number of housing units between now and the year 2030, six years from now. What sounds like a big number to you? If I told you a thousand units, would that sound like a big unit? Much I'm talking about the Upper Valley. Much higher. Yeah, higher. Yeah. How about 3,000? Higher. How about 6,000? Kind of getting close? The number's 10,000. And so the Upper Valley is really looking a little bit like Burlington South. So if you're ambivalent about change, hold on to your hat, because uh, we got to do the best we can in what's really a compelling set of circumstances. Um, people said to me, particularly college classmates, who said, what are you doing when, when I came back here? And I said, well, it boils down to this. First of all, it's home. Extended families here, we've got a, a nice story. It feels good to be home. It has the Vermont brand. It's on the interstate highway system. We're only eight hours from 50 million people. And we have a world-class university. Who could ask for more than that if you're looking at sort of the Chamber of Commerce pitch? So sure enough, a mere 40 years later, some of these things are working out. Infill development in the central business district on a property that's on the bus line just screams out for this site to be used to its maximum potential. It's not where you're going to have a park. And then at the end of the day, 
to have that management team involved, you've got to have the right scale. So one of the players that I went to is the family that owns the Red Lion Inn in Stockbridge, Mass. It was saved by this woman's grandparents, continued by her mother, who's my age, and she today runs what she calls Main Street Hospitality. She has about 10 properties under her belt. And they have looked seriously at being the developer of a new building here, but they can't build a hotel with less than 85 rooms. They'd like to have it be 100. And the cost of building the building points in the direction of hotel room rates somewhere in the high $300 a night range. So I've been encouraged, uh, not the least of whom is the president of Mascoma Bank, to see this as a housing site. So how do you deal with that when your heart says hospitality? I think the answer has to do with what happens on the first floor. So we'll talk about that. Um, meanwhile, this is what I've done. I had to write the case study for the Preservation Trust of Vermont because I could never go back to the historic preservation com uh, community uh, with a straight face unless I didn't make the case, a strong narrative case for this building to be replaced and upgraded. Not in the interest of preserving the architecture, but in the interest of preserving the prominence and the contribution that this site has made over the history of this town. And um, they have largely bought into that argument. That case study is available for you. It's about a 20-page document with some of these images and narratives. The word sense of place comes from a notable mentor and role model, the, uh, the uh, well-revered former president of Dartmouth College by the name of John Sloan Dickey, said in the, in the context of what makes Hanover and Dartmouth so special as it has a sense of place. And that's the kind of mood that I'm striving for. Um, I took off from that uh, essay um, the same architect that did the village apartments here in White River comes from Denver, Colorado, and they did a, a detailed massing study to say if we used up the whole site, what would that building tend to look like? I'm going to show you that slide, but don't go into reaction. It's an abstraction. It's not meant to say this is exactly what it looks like. It's meant to show you what it feels like in terms of the size of it. Um, We've done a property survey and soil borings, engineering evaluations, and environmental conditions. Tearing down this building is a headache. It has asbestos and it has lead paint, and it's going to be expensive. And now we turn to who's going to do it? It's not me. So you can pick on me all you want all the way to the end, but at some point it's going to be somebody calling the shots that really has the ability to pull this off. So my proposition and my contribution uh, to this and to you is to make sure we get the best developer we can get. So I've put out requests for proposals. Uh, these have gone out. Um, the Tuck School has helped me polish this up and make it presentable and create the pathways. And more often than not, the people who take a situation like this seriously, believe it or not, have Dartmouth ties. They've been out in the world doing notable real estate development work, but they still like the idea of having something in the Upper Valley, close to the alma mater. So what's the project potential here? Full lot coverage calls for a five-story building. The opportunity is here for 100 underground parking spaces. Uh, it's mixed use with commercial on the first floor and residential on the top floors. And it's, out, it's yet to be seen to whether, how much of a hotel operation there can be. You know how I feel about it. I've been dissuaded away from it by the numbers and the players, but hope springs eternal. I will be standing up for that as much as you'd ever expect. Um, an opportunity to separate the storm sewers so they don't 
all the water off these roofs don't go to the sewage treatment plant. We're talking about state-of-the-art energy efficiency, and right now there's brewing legislation in the Vermont um, House of Representatives to allow a public utilities commission application to create geothermal heating for this and five other buildings in downtown so that we go into the future not burning fossil fuels. Um, the tax base enhancement to the town of Hartford is on that order of magnitude of several hundred thousand dollars a year more every year, and taxes are forever. So that's an annuity to the town. And then the business stabilization, to pull this off, really strengthens um, the other players in downtown. Here is what the, the um, Denver, Colorado firm came up with in terms of the massing study. And if you look closely, you can see the Gates block in the, in the um, opera house on the far right-hand side and the, uh, uh, the hair salon building in the middle. This was done at a point where it was supposed that it would rise in two different uh, buildings, contiguous, but the front building being a hotel and the back building being apartments. It remains to be seen how that's going to... The height of the building would rival the height of the towers that are there now. Let's see, where was it? And also the height of the phone company building in the back and the height of the village apartments um, diagonally across the street. So it qualifies under the Hartford zoning um, for five stories and it makes maximum use of the property. The specific uses, commercial on the first floor, in my vision, provides for the artists and tenants that are there today to be incubated and brought back in small allotments of space because typically they only need six or 700 square feet per player. I see the front end here being an, a double size event center, twice the size that we have here, so that doing weddings of uh, 150 or more are possible. Um, and with the parking underneath it, um, that seems realistic. And then on the back end, down towards Courier Street, a medical services clinic, and I'm in discussions with Mount Escutney Hospital to see what they might be able to put here to be more readily available because of their rehab center. Um, that's still in the early stages. I couldn't guarantee it, but it's how I'm thinking. Okay? I'm doing this as a pre-developer to make it look as good as I can to the high quality developers that would come along. Workforce housing, affordable housing for the people that do the jobs. Market rate rental housing um, is an offset to the village where uh, are meant for advanced years people. This would be a younger group. And then the municipal underground parking, I see it run essentially the way Hanover runs its municipal parking ramp. Something um, owned by either the town or a nonprofit that's put together to be the owner and work off um, user fees. Um, there's some talk about that geothermal heating district using the basement of this building that would help cut down the cost of the whole structure. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits. We've cut, touched on these before. Tax-based contribution, uh, advance in the housing stock, better use of energy with a heating district, um, the economic multiplier effect for all the merchants in downtown, and it added parking. Uh, why am I doing this? Return on investment. I'm a business thinker. Um, if I were to sell this building tomorrow, uh, the highest bidder, just take it as it is, I would do less well than if I stand in the groove and be the pre-developer and do the work that I'm doing right now. I think it's a better bet for me and I think it's a better bet for you as a taxpayer. Um, and the emotional side is the confirmation of the legacy, both as a local native son and also what did I do here for 40 years? What, I, what would I like to see happen? That's a driver, right? Okay, that's the money and the thinking. Let's talk about the timing. If I'm lucky enough to select a developer by the middle of this summer, confirming the parking financing and the heating district and the various 
uh, submittals to uh, the reviewing agencies could be in full gear by next March, March of 25. Um, confirming permitting and processing by a year from this summer, all of the bidding uh, gyrations where maybe construction could start uh, in September of 25. And if that all happened, the opening uh, night would be New Year's Eve, January 1st. Uh, 2027. That is an ambitious schedule. If that ever happened, um, you can bronze me, okay? <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you this, don't build a statue. That's where pigeons go to poop. <laughs> so um, that's the pitch. I've rambled through it, but tried to keep it on pace. I told Sue when she got here that this talk was a cure for insomnia. <laughs> And I think it worked. Weren't you sleeping back there, Sue? <laughs> um, anyway, I want to turn it back to have an ample amount of time for you to ask me all the questions you ever wanted to ask. And I'm tough. I can take it. So let it rip. Joey. Don't know. The original, the original configuration for uh, housing and hotel was 40 large apartments and 65 hotel rooms. It's now thought that we could probably do 100 total housing units, 30 or 40 being workforce housing and the rest being market rate. Um, a comment and then another question. Market rate's untenable. It really is. It's crazy. People can't afford to live in Davidson's building for those studios with no closets. Um, so the words market rate scare me. Um, but the, the other question is 100 parking spaces with that many units, plus um, uh, the ground floor being um, artists, what did you call it, artisan artists. space and retail? When I say artists and tenants, I mean people like Mark Estes and Ken Blaisdell okay. white in the Valley Flower. Yeah, yeah. Um, those people. That doesn't seem like enough parking. Well, like I say, I'm teeing this up to the development community. Yeah. It's going to be their issue. Uh -huh. And I, I have my own feelings and opinions about what you just said. If I can't convince them, then this doesn't happen. So that kind of takes care of itself. They're bringing the investment dollars and taking the risk. And I mean, I guess what I would suggest uh, how would you feel if what I just described happened? Would you think that was a travesty? Or would you rather see me walk away and take your chances on somebody else? No, I, I, I personally, I think it needs to be done. Like you yeah. said, the building is in disrepair. Right. It's a better use of the space. It'll be sad to see the hospitality end go. Um, if I was 57 I instead of 77, I would strive to be the developer, but I, it's not in me. My fear is the affordability for the units, and yeah. you know what people call market rate in the Upper Valley is just—it's ridiculous. I, we have you know people that work at Big Fatties that live an hour away so they can afford the rent. Yeah. That's just you know. Well, what I'm running into, and in, I'd like to see it all workforce housing, scale based on income. But the developers are telling me, based on what it costs to build this building, yeah. they're not going to do it without a rate of return. Yeah, I, I understand. OK. Um, I've worked with Evernorth and Twin Pines. Uh, their notion of what a project here would fit their diet was something around 30 or 40 units. So they could end up owning those 30 or 40 units as a turnkey acquisition from the developer, mm -hmm. or they could be merged into this to where it's a joint venture and they do it. But the other side is going to be driven by the free market. It's not going to be what any one of us think would be a cooler idea. It's going to be driven by the market. Tracy. I think you probably saw this question coming. What about the murals? Where does the mural go, right? Um, well, the preservation of it. I mean, yeah. Obviously, it can be uh, by the way, I put this slide up because this is the end point of the mural. It's in the cafe across the lobby. It's the end point of the story. Um, and I would encourage you to come back and suffer another lecture from me, and I'll spend an hour or so telling you the story. But one of the options for this is for it to be incorporated in the new building. And I would think 
that the uh, developer would be keenly interested in that, particularly if they do the event center scenario. If they take this first floor space and chop it up, uh, there wouldn't be a place for an 85 foot long mural. What do you do with this, right? And how do you keep it accessible? Well, one possible no notion, and this one has some legitimacy, but it's not, it's not likely to be ever again as accessible as we've been able to make it. I'm here 24 seven or somebody is. You can walk in here at three o'clock in the morning and say, I gotta have a mural fix and we'll give it to you, right? <laughs> you can get in here. Um, so where does it go? Um, so here's a little background. You see the guy swinging the ax there? The model for that picture is a guy named Bob O'Brien. And he was a student of the Dartmouth professor that inspired the mural to be done this way. And you know it was done by Mike Gish, who we lost this last week at age 98. And then the back corner is a self-portrait of the artist, Mike Gish. His lady friend Elsie was from Enfield, and Elsie died two years ago. Um, anyway, Bob O'Brien was the class of 39 at Dartmouth. And he was idealistic. He wanted to know what to do uh, with his energy. His, his philosophy professor at Dartmouth that inspired the murals helped him and others create an experimental CCC camp um, in Tunbridge, Vermont. It was called Camp William James. The inspiration for that was the William James essay called The Moral Equivalent of War. And a whole bunch of Dartmouth and Harvard guys went to Tunbridge. And, and pitched in up until the time of Pearl Harbor. Well, Bob O'Brien was so passionate about his experience and his time in Tunbridge that he raised his family there. And Bob's son is John O'Brien, the filmmaker that brought you Fred Tuttle in with the plan. So it's a wonderful story. And so it would be totally appropriate for these murals to end up at the Tunbridge Fair in a permanent pole barn kind of a facility that's cleverly done so that one person could, who's authorized could open them up to the general public on a repeat basis. And they'd be a permanent ornament for the fair. That's an idea. So prior to tearing the building down, how do you properly dispose of all the furnishings and fixtures? And you have like one dealer come in, bid on it, and take all the stuff out. You're not going to bury everything. Furnishings and fixtures are marginal here. Um, in fact, I'll tell you one of the ways that Peggy and I have coped with keeping it sort of authentic without going broke is that um, we buy it from salvage companies and Marriott gets rid of its furniture every seven years whether they need it or not. So um, a chair like you're sitting in would cost $150. I can buy it for $15. Yeah, because you got a guy right across the street. Well, they don't deal in this stuff. There's a guy in Derry, New Hampshire that does that. His big warehouse is called Deja Vu. <laughs> We've been known to go there with a truck and come back with it full of stuff. Yeah. Patricia. Um, I'm wondering about the, the brakes, uh, you know, the Gates brakes block. Uh, the, Your discussion is really about the hotel. Yeah, the deal with the preservation community from square one, and it shows up in that case study, is to preserve the prominence and the dignity of this site and preserve the Gates building as is, as the historic element. And what I've been doing, standing tall there, is trying to hold on to the notion that the Briggs Opera House will be um, part of the deal for the subsequent purchaser of that building. I've created a nonprofit called Briggs Opera House Inc. And I've told um, the board members, the founding board members who are helping me keep it open sort of as a shell so that it could be fleshed out, would look more like the group that brought us Northern Stage and the Barrett Center. And the deal that I've proposed is that we would take that out of the pro forma of that building and give it to them for a dollar as a condominium if they would fix it up to be totally code compliant and modernized and endow it. The theater, you mean? The theater, so it would always be a theater. And, like, you know, I'm interested, what, what would be the fate of sort of the rest of the, of the, the Briggs block? The, the new building? owner will decide the new that. Owner will yeah. Decide. I've heard people talking about uh, converting it to housing because they're so, you know how we are in real estate development, when something's hot, it's so hot people have blinders and they can't see anything else and whatever's hot. 
I don't aspire to that, but I've experienced it. Um, uh, so again, it's up to who buys it. What I'm trying to do is get the opera house well enough situated so that would be a condition of the sale. Or if it were to be sold tomorrow, I couldn't do that. I haven't gotten the community uh, support. It's about a $10 million proposition, $3 million to fix it and $7 million to endow it. The theater? Yeah. If you endow it at $7 million, it produces $200,000 a year forever to run it so that the Waldorf School and the parish players and everybody can use it on the, you know, the bare bones fees that we've charged. But they can do it forever, and unless they really are incompetent, they can't mess that up. <laughs> but um, that's been a tougher sell. I would have thought I would have been surrounded by 10 people that were ex as excited as they were for Northern Stage, or Listen, or Vins, or Montshire, or The Haven. It hasn't happened. And if I had a 32-hour day, maybe I could have done that. So. Yeah, mercy. A couple questions. Um, you spoke about underground parking as a potential as part of the design, and you also spoke about geothermal as a potential way to heat and provide energy, which would be really exciting. Are those two things mutually exclusive? Uh, how, to start, the, well, to start they are because the parking here is a function of the development. The geothermal uh, initiative is coming from Hartford's own Energy Commission, and they approach me and saying we have an idea where White River could be seen as ideal because we have the density to have five or six buildings on it. And as we speak, they're getting ready to um, refurbish the courthouse, and they want to use geothermal there. So at the beginning, it would be mutually exclusive. You'd have parking, and then how I'm trying to understand. Well, the design of it would anticipate the infrastructure needed for the geothermal I thing. See. So this basement project could accommodate that right along with the parking. As, okay, as well yeah. as and conceptually, it would be a parallel goal. Yeah. Okay. Unified. But the exciting part is that helps to mitigate the cost of demolishing the building and things like that. My other question had to do with, I liked what you said about the sense of place. And if you ever knew the Hanover Inn in its old days mm -hmm. and what it is now, how very, very different they are. Um, in Christmas, you could go in and have an apple sit there or have a cookie in the front of it. It was very, very unique. New Hampshire, Northern New England, and very quaint. Um, but it's not owned by Dartmouth. It's owned by the folks who have it. And it is a very glitzy feeling. It is not what we had as a sense of place, in my view. Um, well, that's my starting point. I understand. How well I do in terms of who gets to be the developer here and remains so to be seen. When you spoke of having first floor hospitality, that's your preference because that's what you love. And then how would you have that with artisans and keep what we see conceptually in a different version? The new building here has enough square footage. It has 22,000 square feet so that what you've experienced here as a gathering place can be twice the size. I see. It can still have room for six or eight artisan tenants and a medical clinic on the far end. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. In uh, 1990, I have the pleasure of hiring you for a, the, the place what? Uh, hiring you to give a lecture to a group of Germans and uh, people working on the Middle East who were looking at how you reconstitute public spaces and you walked around the town with us. I paid you a lot of money. <laughs> I won't repeat the, the, the It was amount. pretty embarrassing, yeah. Uh, it's, it's embarrassing, the amount. But we got our money's worth. But my question for you is this, and the conversations afterward, and this is something where I'd be going to Germany for a period of time, some people were kind of throwing up their hands at how they could get redevelopment started in various parts of the former Eastern Germany. 
and had people looking at equivalent sorts of things in Turkey, the Yemen, and other places. And my question is jumping beyond the very good local questions here. Is any such development possible if you don't have a strong local person able to put the pieces together in that particular place? And the corollary question that I would have there is, you know, having hired you for the, some magnificent sub in 1990 before you got the, you know, your excellent presentation put together, uh, um, um, uh, how many people locally does it take to get the synergy to pull this sort of stuff off? Would it be possible without having a David Briggs or the <laughs> Well, one of the things that was the biggest challenge early on was what I called co lack of cohesion. How many people were in the room at any one time thinking on the same page? And it's a moving target, right? And we've arrived at a place in White River Junction now where I'm eclipsed. I mean, this place has a life of its own and an energy of its own. Um, in fact, uh, people's eyes glaze over when I tell these stories because they're so old. They ha they're on their own theme. So how did, how did we get there? Um, I don't know. I've, I've seen other or heard of other stories where it happens faster. In my years in St. Paul, it happened in a five-year period. Um, critical mass was one of the numbers we, terms we use. You know, I had enough of the like-minded people that would do things, and um, so it's a it's a real challenge. It's not an exact science. Do you have the critical mass now? Well, I don't know if we have it in terms of this this project because I think at this point it's going to be me finding the right developer. I think the town understands it. More and more people that are um, involved with the town understand it. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission for Hartford naturally um, raised their eyebrows when we told them that it was pointing in the direction of tearing the building down. And when they came and saw all the reports and did the tour of the building, they got immediately excited about how good the new building was going to be. <laughs> yeah because it's tough to make this work. We talked about uh, retaining the facade and all of that thing for the usual emotional reasons. It's just not enough substance here to do that. They did that in Montpelier. If you're familiar with the um, pavilion office building, that, that is just a facade that emulates what was there before, and the rest of the building is totally modern. It doesn't apply to here. Yeah. Joey. I'm just curious, what happens to the small businesses when you start to have a Well, that's an interesting question. For a while, when I was hoping this would go faster, I had built Newberry Market with the idea that I could put them there. But you've seen what's happened. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what the quick remedy is. There are a couple of spaces right now, um, and one of them is on the corner here next to the filling station. There's about 2,000 square feet in there. I've always wondered why that remains vacant. Well, it's another one of the great war stories. <laughs> we could get into that. Do you own the salon building? No, no. The one out back here? I'm turning around yeah. around here. Yeah, the one Mar in the middle of the Yeah, building. Marcia Johnson Landon owns okay. that building. Yes? Just a historical question. Why did you're sitting next to ground zero on that question. You want me to answer that, Fred? Well, the building was not owned by the town, right? It was owned by the Loyal Club? The Loyal Club was a, you know, what we would call today a nonprofit, right? Um, the plan was hatched that White River, a town like White River, deserved to have a central public library. And to get enough resources together, it pointed in the direction of giving up Queechee, West Hartford, Wilder, um, and Hartford Village. And there's, we, what we learned in that was central public libraries have a very important role to play, like the, um, what's the name of the library? Kilton. Um, but in the case of Hartford, our little uh, 
individual villages use the library as a place to be. It's not just a library. If it was just a repository of books and resource materials, you could say, go to White River, the mothership is there, but those things are more precious than that. And so it was a little bit of a political squabble that discouraged uh, going ahead with the Central Public Library, and Kilton came along within a fairly short time, and it's only a mile away. So what to do with that building? Um, one of the doctors at the Hitchcock, what's Paul's last name? Manganello. Manganello, yeah. The doctors got together and created that um, a good neighbor health clinic. Well, that's great, but it's just to, not to have a library. Could agree. Yeah. Well, but the Kilton is, you could it's argue. It's not White River. You're, yeah. you're putting all of this into White River Junction and yeah. telling well, I see, I'm an advocate for the Upper Valley writ large and have been right along. Could the Good Neighbor Clinic be part of, instead of Maliscutney, pulled into this project and the library can be given back? Ah, that's a great Don't know. Don't know. Can you make, add that to your I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, <laughs> well, when I put my developer or business hat on, yeah. I say no because here's the na naughty little truth. The medical services industry will play, pay full market rent for new construction. And so they represent viability to the developer. They know they can get the full nickel for that. Whereas the good neighbor limps along with local philanthropy. So could it happen? Yeah, I suppose. But it would be another one of those many miracles. Yeah. Joey? Sorry. Um, I heard you mention that there'd be a clinic on the first floor. I said that's my target, is that the first floor would be ideally used as a medical services clinic to fill up the first floor, because it can't be housing on the first floor. But we have the good neighbor. We have the good neighbor, but that's not what this would do. This would be a specialty clinic like Mount Escutney Rehab, oh, okay. paying full market rent makes it easier for the developer to say, how am I going to fill this up? I mean, one of the levels of reticence on Ever North and Twin Pines is they don't know how to fill up commercial spaces. It's not their thing. It's a headache for them. So part of the role I'm playing is to go out and beat the bushes with bright ideas. So I'd be happy to see the Good Neighbor Clinic there. I think the architect did a splendid job preserving the architectural dignity of that building inside and out. It doesn't answer the question about what you do for library services. Well, library, it's more than just books. As we said, yeah, yeah. Yes. Fred. I was just going to point out, though, that um, both that building and the uh, collection at Hobbs were not particularly well suited to the needs of the community. And uh, while the effort to establish a central community, a central library for the town, did not amount to much of anything, did have a very lasting effect in increasing the cooperation among the various local libraries. The fact that the Wilder Library is now run as a branch of the Leachy Library, for example. Uh, the fact that um, uh, books can be delivered to different parts of the town and so forth. And the whole nature of library and library resources has changed too. An awful lot of access to libraries nowadays not even being in the place, but using a collection on the internet and so forth. Um, if, uh, I don't know if you've uh, remember going into some of those small libraries and seeing what they had, but uh, a bunch of old books, not well chosen, well arranged, is not a good library. <clears throat> well, Kilton sort of demonstrated that for us, right? Well, I have one last little thing to end up on, just on a good note. This is a picture from the Vermont State Fair. And when I got this picture, it came in the form of a postcard through eBay. Um, I wasn't smart enough to realize that I could have just gone to the University of Vermont and got all the pictures I ever wanted, but they trickled in $7 at a time, right? And I was attracted to this one because the title in the eBay ad was Lady Wrestling, White River Junction. <laughs> so I bought it, and I paid $28 for it. 
And uh, when I got it, I thought, oh, I was, you know, I was uh, hoodwinked here. But if you look carefully on the midway, you can see a banner that says Lady Wrestling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but here's the sweet part of the story. First of all, if you look, you'll see there's a lot of people. They're well dressed. This is a big deal. It's important to them. It has social cachet. Uh, all the right people are there, so to speak, and it's it's a big deal. Um, we were told this story as kids that the White River State Fair um, began as the official state fair in 1907. And on that year, a little old lady asked a Victorian gentleman for some water for her horse. And he said no. And she put a jinx on the fair and it started to rain. <laughs> and it rained all day. It rained every day of fair week. It rained every day of every fair week for 20 years <laughs> until it finally got relocated to Rutland on the tail end of the 27 flood. Now that was in Ripley's Believe It or Not, right? So I get this card and I look at it and I see they're well dressed, they're having a good time. And I turn it over and it was executed and it was uh, delivered to a, a woman named Carrie Dudley in Millbury, Mass. And the writer had put on Friday, 10 a.m., White River Junction, raining hard. <laughs> Isn't that the best? So thank you so much for listening and being here.